Oh, okay, that was a bit of a rocky start, but <laughs> I think we'll be all right from now on. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pixel Civ. This is episode 101 of the podcast. My name is Mitch, and if this is your very first time watching, we're a show that celebrates indie game development from around Australia and the world, as well as the big issues from the gaming wider culture. Joining me today in the studio is my co-host, Scott. Hey, hey, hey. how are we doing? And uh, joining us this week is our guest, David Lloyd from Power Hoof in Melbourne. Hello, Dave. Hello. And thank you for hey. joining us. And uh, Dave is here to talk about his latest game, Regular Human Basketball. But before we get to that, uh, what are we looking at first, Scott? Yes, first we'll be looking at the recent changes Germany has made to their consumer law regarding pre-ordering games and whether or not something like that might be a good idea here in Australia. All right, all that coming up shortly. Hey there, if you're enjoying the show and you want to hear more, subscribe to Pixel Sift on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify or listen on pixelsift.com.au. See you there. So, yes, last week in Germany, the law was changed to ban pre-orders on products that have vague or unclear release dates. This is a big deal for game retailers since game pre-orders are big business. What does this mean? Well, if you're German business and you try to offer something uh, for pre-order that is coming soon or 2019, you could be in a bit of trouble. Yeah, so I, that's that's something that's bothered me about pre-orders for a long time is that you can't like they can say it and say hey we this game is coming out someone told us it was coming out and you can lay down actual money for it but we don't really have to yeah like where's the accountability you you know the games are going to come out eventually but yeah stretching it a bit maybe so a couple of games that i've been looking at and wanting to get for a while um I've, i've been looking at um so i uh death stranding last of us part two and cyberpunk 2077 and um, so I called EB Games and JB Hi-Fi yesterday to ask if I could pre-order all of these, and they all said yes, actually. <laughs> yeah, and, okay. And the uh, and the EB Games consultant was the only one that actually said, "Oh yeah, just letting you know that these don't have release dates yet." So um, they actually warned me. Well, yeah. I mean, if there's no uh, framework of law stopping people from giving them money, then retailers are definitely not going to let uh, you know not let that happen. It just uh, that's bad for business. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the basically the, the, well, the way this is working in Germany, Germany is that, uh, as I said, vague orders of coming soon or just basically not giving a foreseeable delivery date, um, is against the law now. So you, they must indicate the latest day by which the product will be delivered, um, or not offer a pre-order. Um, that's from the high regional court of Munich. Oh, okay. Mm. So the the re the ruling has came up come out after a consumer protection claim was made against German retailer Media Markt uh, over the pre order offer for a smartphone Galaxy Six uh, in August 2016. Um, but the ruling applies to all products, including video games. So Dave, as an indie developer, up is pre ordering a big deal for you? No, not really. Um, you can kind of you can do it, but. It's, uh, I think it's the sort of thing where it's sometimes nice to show a developer that you care by pre-ordering something that they've, you know, if they let you. Um, if you're indie, that's kind of nice for you to have some, to know there's some people who are like excited about your game. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, from a consumer standpoint, I think it's almost always a bad thing. Um, yeah, so it's a bit like a, a bit like Kickstarter. You kind of you want to go into it knowing this might never happen, but I want to support the developer or something like that. Um, and when it's something like that, I think it's not too bad. But you know, when it's a AAA company, it's never that's never really the case. It's just they want they want as much money as they can get. <laughs> and um, I mean, that doesn't it. really matter if the the projects or the yeah you know, the project turns out well or not because it's different people who who are doing the project than are getting the pre-order stuff happening. So but I'm yeah. not someone who ever- India doesn't. Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. No, let's go ahead. I personally, um, and I know obviously I don't speak for everybody, but I don't pre-order games. Uh, I just don't. I've never really saw the benefit in it unless you're getting some kind of amazing, you know, trophy or model or something that you really desire and you're a collector like that. I don't understand. Like, you know, it's not like they're going to not have enough and you're going to miss out. You may, you know, you maybe m- miss out on, fir- on day one. And if you're that kind of keen person, then I do understand. Like one of my best friends pre-sales for that exact reason like they'll even take the day off when you know their games come out just because that's their thing um but for me i'm like why would i pre-order games and like who is it for you know like 
it seems yeah. it seems to be almost anti-consumer. Um, yeah. Chris Wright um, from uh, Surprise Attack, uh, this this the marketing firm um, said he explained that pre-orders uh, are part of the retail process that they inform the retailer and they also um, orders the publisher. Um, the publisher bases their orders based on that demand. Um, so, you know, p- publishers want to get pre-orders up. That helps you sell more stock. That's why so many of these offers, uh, these offers are about pre-orders for specialist games. It's basically money in the bank. I I guess it's like, it's almost like they're monetizing gamers' passion almost mm. in, in a way. Yeah. Like they they kind of just take advantage of the the very emotional response that someone has to a product that they're really excited for. Usually it's, it's sequels and things like that where the pre-orders go out the door almost. But then with two of the two of these games I just mentioned, they're not sequels. They're they're ready to go. Um, like we oh we look at we we see cases like Duke Nukem Forever that was announced <laughs> in 1997 wasn't released until 2011. 14 years worth of pre-order waiting. <laughs> yeah, and people were pre-ordering during that yeah. time. That's nuts. Yeah, people posted their receipts of their pre-orders, yeah. and, and they're all and like some of them discolored. Some of them and stuff. were on it as well. Yeah, wild. I mean, like <laughs> the, the 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 most I guess. Um, the, the, the fact that blows me away the most in that time is that 10 other Duke Nukem titles were released during that time, you know, on other consoles. <laughs> it's not like it wasn't a doable thing, you know. Yeah. And, and the, st- the stats from that as well. And within that time, PlayStation 2, 3, and PSP were created. Xbox and Xbox 360 went out. Nintendo's Game Boy Color, Advance, DS, GameCube, and Wii were all created like in the that time. hardware was being yeah, released. Done. Hardware and games. So I think I saw on that list the entire. That was a Halo. big exception, though. I mean, that was um, oh, who was it behind that? Three D Realms. That was Three mm-hmm. D Realms is Duke Nukem. And it it does. And then some retailers closed down. So like, well, they- it, it put Three D Realms out of business eventually. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the details about that. Take Two took over, but I don't think they decided to fund it, and then it came out anyway. I don't know. It was weird because I'm pretty sure Three D Realms went down the year before that. But you know, I digress. Yeah, it does. It does make you wonder, like, what? When does it become stop being the same game anymore? Like after that, so much time, it's like, is are they justified in saying, okay, it's not the same game anymore? Well, pre-order uh, it again. I'll just take that point onto more of the topic of what we're talking about now. Is is it the same game? Like, the, I don't have a problem with the pre-orders per se, as long as it's not a retail specific um, pre-order where you're going to get something special from, you know, EB or JB or whatever, like. When Ubisoft is a really good example of how to do it wrong, uh, what when Watch Dogs come out came out, there was ten different editions, um, each with differing types of content. Uh, you know that that can be a really difficult thing, like um, I guess a maze to get through. Um, and just to bring it back to us and why this is important for us in Australia is because Germany has. I would say somewhat similar uh, rules to Australia in the fact that it's very pro-consumer um, type pr- protection laws. Um, so hopefully we will see that kind of protection um, extended over here. I mean, there was obviously the landmark ruling in 2016 where our federal court took Valve to uh, pay penalties totaling $3 million for breaching Australian consumer law for false or misleading mm-hmm. Um, consumers. So, and then the global community got refunds as a result of that. Well, that's it. You know, it was um, it was the it was the Australian um, consumer policies affecting the international market. And I feel like hopefully it will be a two way street this time, and Germany's pro consumer choices will make their way into our um, whatevers because <laughs> it'd be good for people. You know, yeah. like uh, I, d- I don't like the ideas of I don't like where pre-sales seem to be sliding down to, you know, it's very different to when it was initially, you know, 15 years ago when it was like, you know, 20, 20 down, 20 off. And it was like, yeah, cool. I get that. Um, yep. You know, I'm making sure I'm going to get one on day one, but all these very expensive incentives, um, especially, especially retail exclusives. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sold. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm completely, completely against it. Sorry, David, go on. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the, the, ex- the exclusive, exclusive content things always, I I prefer if games never had that because you just know you're getting the full game. That's and it. The, the problem that you're not getting the full soon game. As you've got pre-orders. You really need that because otherwise, you know, you sort of want to give them something for pre-ordering. Otherwise, they're basically just paying you for nothing <laughs> and and t- taking the risk upon themselves that the game might be terrible when it comes out. Um, so and- yeah, you, you know, with if you've got pre-orders, you sort of 
need to have the exclusive content stuff. And then when you've got that, it's just a bit like, oh, I've, I've just got this weird version of the game without this yeah. thing, but it's got this other thing instead. And, and imagine, imagine being a completionist, you know, and you've got yeah, 10 different yeah. versions of Watch Dogs coming out and you're sent, like, you know, you're ostensibly, if you need to f- do that properly, you need to buy 10 copies of the game, which is just ludicrous. <laughs> and then all those things will not be on that one version of the game you have, no. right? It's just... No. No. It, oh. Yep. Anyway, <laughs> enough about that. I think we should move on to talk to Dave about his game, Totally Human. Nope, nope. that's throwing you off. <laughs> uh, sorry, I did that, and I'll explain why <laughs> after this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Wait. Let's move on to the interview. Hey, Mitch, what are you doing this Friday? Uh, I'm playing Fortnite this Friday. But didn't you hate that game? Yeah, but I'm going to go get my pickaxe anyway. What time is it on? It's on at 7.30pm on every Friday night. We play Fortnite and I hate it. You'll love it. (sighs) On twitch.tv forward slash pixel sift. Yes, so we're joined by David Lloyd from Powerhoof in Melbourne. He's a programmer and designer and tonight he joins us to talk about regular human basketball, (laughs) which is available for everyone to play. Uh, So... David, for everyone not in the know yet, what is regular human basketball? Um, oh, it's really all in the title. It's uh, you take your giant robot and you get inside it and you pick up the ball with your magnet and uh, turn on your thrusters and dunk it in the net. Exactly and, like uh, humans do. Now, we had this discussion exactly. at PAX, I remember, regular. and I said you just said a bunch of things that are you know, at, at odds <laughs> with uh, the name there. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'll, I'll just jump in and excuse Mitch's um, fluffery with the name. <laughs> I've been doing it since, I mean, I did it at PAX when I interviewed you then. Um, I all the time get it mixed up with a group called Totally Enormous Extinct Dinosaurs. I know it's not the same, (laughs) but every time I go to say it, I say that instead. Or I just do a hybrid of the both. Terrible. Kind of works, though. Yeah, I do apologize. I'm trying. (laughs) I, I actually keep getting confused with real human basketball because it was we, we it was titled that very early on for like a week oh, and I keep okay. calling it that even though I changed it. <laughs> so where did the idea originally come from to do uh, this kind of um, basketball with a twist? Uh, it started out we, we were doing these little game jams. Um, this is before there was much in the way of local multiplayer, um, and and we kind of wanted to make some games to just play together. Um, so this is back when you know still like Xbox 360 and stuff like that and and that kind of era where they just yeah there wasn't really many games that you could play with friends all the console games coming out didn't have split screen things like that so and this is before um uh Towerfall and Nidhogg and things like that as well so yeah we we just jammed out a bunch of games to with the sort of objective of going and um having some drinks and playing them all uh and yeah, it was it was really fun, and that's where this the sort of idea for this game came out, as well as the idea for Crawl, which is our other main title. Another um, one that we're a huge, obviously, big fans of, featuring on our Pixel yeah. Plays, uh, <laughs> and was on one of our runner, runners for their Pixel Parties games as well. Mm. Uh, and now you've delivered us another joyous entertainment activity. So I got a question from Moody Zander in the chat. They are, they ask why basketball of all sports. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I, I don't really no like so when we first had the idea of it started out as a very technical and a boring game where you're kind of wiring up robots with sensors and things like that and and then we realized it might be more fun if you're jumping around inside them and turning on buttons and stuff and if they're all physical and it was a bit like co-op if you remember bennett body's co-op yeah um (laughs) where you're just constantly falling over and just and and that kind of led to the idea of like it being something really simple you do like picking up a ball and putting it in the net as opposed to, you know, fighting hordes of enemies or something like that. So um, we both really liked the idea of um, something pretending to be human or just pretending to be completely normal as well, which, uh, say, like, Octodad did that really well. Um, just like, oh, this guy's an octopus. No, he's just a normal dad. He's you know, going about his, doing his dad things. But yeah, that, that kind of that I got kind a of subreddit you might thought it hilarious. I got a subreddit <laughs> you might like, Dave. It's called Totally oh, Not yeah. Robots. <laughs> should, it's r slash totally not robots uh you should totally check that out um i got a i got a question from s vindle um will there be a switch version like you did for crawl uh we'll see how it goes i think it would be a good fit but yeah we'll just have to see how it goes on, on steam and whether it's worth it basically now this game 
there was a release of it in some form uh, dating back to 2015. Um, yeah. How much changed since that original free release? I must meant much must mention. Um, we kept the core. We tried to keep the core pretty much the same, um, but like uh, just tweaked and, and enhanced. And then we've added um, a bunch of different arenas. So you're still piloting the same robots, but <clears> then there's a bunch of different arena hazards and, and sort of switches in the arenas and some of them and uh, different level layouts. Um, it's got online multiplayer, which is kind of a, a big ticket feature. Maybe <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, and uh, yeah, new art, new music. Um, kind of a, a whole kind of pass on everything. Um, but we, we tried to keep it kind of, tried to keep it kind of small in terms of the scope just so we could keep the price down. So it's like five bucks. It's not, not trying to turn it into a giant game that costs 30 bucks and has like a single player campaign or anything like that. Just trying to keep it basically the same thing that people were already enjoying, but a nice enhanced version. So how long did it take you uh, to in the process take to get from the free version in 2015 to the present level? Um, well, I guess it's been that whole time. Three years. <laughs> so did, was yeah. that it? As soon as you, you didn't stop working on it, it uh, no, or no, did no. you yeah, put it no, out free and then go back to it? Yeah, we didn't do much for for a long time. So I was working on crawl mainly. Yeah, okay. Um, came back to it uh, last year once we shipped crawl on PC and stuff. But then I came back to crawl for um, to do that on Switch, and um, so I've been kind of going back and forth a bit. But yeah. I kind of been doing even before we finished crawl on uh, finished sort of the early access um, side of crawl. I'd been spending a little bit of time on it, but mainly just on sort of developing tools um, for Unity that we use on other projects as well. So I don't know. I think all up, oh, it's really hard to say. It's probably like adds up to a year and a half but um, of, like, man time. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. But that's, like, me and Barney, so split between the two of us. Um, that's kind of my very, very rough uh, estimate in terms of working out if we'll, we'll have sort of um, made our money back on it <laughs> when it comes to that stage. But, yeah, that's about as close as I can get in terms of estimating. Hey, so if you're just joining us, this is Pixel Civ. My name is Mitch, and our guest this week is Dave Lloyd from a Melbourne-based developer, Powerhoof. We're talking about Dave's new game, Regular Human Basketball, which is a local multiplayer basketball game where you control a dunking mech with a team of friends. So I want to I want to ask. So you developed Crawl, and it's a it's a it's a very different kind of multiplayer game, Crawl. And this is Regular Human Basketball is a very different game in itself. So are other development processes like um, do they differ from one another? Um, not. Uh, I mean, crawl, crawl was in early access for a long for a long time, like a few years. So that that had a very slow development process that was sort of based on adding content. But at, at the start of it, we built the game so that it could kind of work with a very small amount of content. So only you know a few monsters and um, and still be completely functional. Uh, and the the early stage was pretty similar. Like it was it was iterating on a on a core concept that that was, you know, that had been put together for a game jam. Um, and I, I find that works really well. And even with a game that you've released, like, you know, we had the 2015 version of regular human basketball. Um, I, I think that works, just works having that kind of early prototype that's playable, that's come out of a game jam to just build upon. Um, I think as uh, that's, I think something we're going to keep doing uh, in terms of making new games and new content, just because we, we like doing game jams. They're really fun and, and you get to sort of, get to try really creative things but if it if it doesn't end up being really fun then it doesn't matter you haven't lost anything whereas if you just dive into a full project that is you know at minimum going to take you two years then you, you you're taking a lot of risk i guess um that it's not going to be fun to play at the end um is there anything you learned specifically specifically from crawl um that made it into regular human basketball um I, th- I mean, I think there's a lot just because it's sort of four years of development and learning from that. Um, but I don't, I can't really think of very specific things. Like it's all just like really small, subtle things probably. Um, like I think some of the, it's really hard to say. Yeah. That I think people who play it might, then there might be things they're like, oh yeah, I can kind of see how this sort of feels like it's made by the same people, but I, I've really got no idea. Um, it's really hard to tell. 
yeah <laughs> i mean it's a very in terms of tone it's very different um it's much sort of sort of wackier in terms of the tone with crawl we were like oh we'll, we'll make it really serious and all the wackiness can just come out of the people who are playing it <clears throat> whereas with this we're just like oh we'll just make it really silly <laughs> it'll be fun now i mentioned speaking to you at pax uh, last year um how was that experience for you in the end? I remember uh, in the interview you mentioned that things were going smoother than you'd even hoped. So uh, how was it after all things were said and done? Yeah, it was great. Like it's the best kind of game to show at PAX, like having a bunch of people playing a game all looking at the same screen and shouting at each other. I think it's perfect for that environment. You definitely had um, one of the most hyped sections, uh, not only because of this, so many players involved, but just because of the uh, the fun of the game in general, which I always love <laughs> about the indie um, showcase. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, that was the that was the thing that I guess one of the reasons I really always wanted to make this into a into something we can sell is just the you can um someone scores a goal has been there right from the start because <laughs> it's yeah, uh, that that bit's always been there and it's always been um been making me feel good about making this game basically now a question i'm always interested to know, to know uh from other developers and uh, that, that that go to packs um so post packs like how how does the packs ex- experience affect the game or how has it ex- affected the game um well it's pretty good play testing really like there's not much opportunity to get eight people around it um it's yeah, it's so, playtesting to the next level. I think that's why I'm yeah, always absolutely. interested to see what comes out of that. Yeah, you, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt because you've got pe- people are in a different mode when they're at a PAX or something like that. So people tend to want to jump in and instantly be able to play it and they don't want to spend a bit of time figuring it out or mm-hmm. they, they usually don't concentrate very well on it. So if you've got a game that usually you get them to play a bit of a tutorial, they're just going to skip it all and play it, even if they would usually at home read it all and stuff like that so you kind of have to take that stuff into to account when if people are under people aren't getting something you've got to be like oh, are they not getting it because of the environment they're in and their friends looking over their shoulders so they're a bit nervous or i'm well, not nervous but you know they, they want to <laughs> yeah skip past the boring bit or whatever um but in yeah in broad terms it's, it's super useful <laughs> like you just get so many different eyes and so many different people from different backgrounds and like in terms of how much they play games and um it gives you a really good overview so we we tend to like try and put a bunch of kind of untested content in there just so we can um, see how it goes with people playing it. And and we can always just like rip it out if it's terrible and everyone hates it so <laughs> they don't have to keep playing it. But um, yeah, that, that worked really well. Um, I got a question from another question from uh, Moody Zander in the chat. Um, how many players can fit into one mech at a time? Uh, uh, we haven't really tested it. There's no, there's no sort of hard-coded upper limit. So... We've played um, with eight, uh, so f- you know four and four, and then obviously you can you can jump out of your mech and into the other one as well. So you get <laughs> a lot in <laughs> that way. But um, but then I've I've done some sort of twelve player just testing load matches, um, o- over the network and, but it, but not not trying to play a proper game really. Basically, as soon as you get, I think if you get past four in each team, it gets pretty much completely unmanageable to try and coordinate <laughs> what you're doing. Everyone's <laughs> just flipping switches everywhere and everything's going crazy. Um, four is four was it was fun at PAX <clears throat> playing with four on a team and having uh, me or Barney or, or Louis who was helping us out uh, coaching th- what the team that they were on. So we had like two coaches and then three people trying to all <laughs> um, succeed at dunking the ball because um, that meant we could manage things a bit. But yeah, the teams were a bit managed and it worked really well. Um, but I think when, when f- people first play with the big team, it's always just like crazy over the top no one can do anything <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see how far people push it now that there'll be online multiplayer in there so dave can you tell us why you make games and why you make the games you do what what inspires you um i think ever ever, ever since i first started doing programming in general i've just i just like making things and seeing them work and games are just the best way of doing that you just like you see something moving around on screen that's really exciting um, and then there's always some new thing that you've read about that you want to try out yourself and, and make something. Um, and yeah, like the, the game jam stuff, I just love at the moment. We're doing like a, a bunch of year of just little, little games and, um, doing them quickly and 
polishing them up a bit and putting like sound and, and stuff in and, and fun ideas and just putting them up for people to play is just really rewarding because you, you just get so much out of it that you don't get, um, you don't get so much if you're working in a big studio because you've got a, a long project and all you're doing it on, on it is one one small part of it. Like, you know, for, if you're a programmer, you might just be doing the sort of physics or something and you're not really having an effect on the whole gameplay. So so that's really what, what I really love about what we're doing at the moment is just being a little tiny team, um, being able to do lots of little little experimental games and um and just make just making stuff that that whole like I think if I wasn't computer games, it'd be um, making something else with my hands or whatever. <laughs> yeah, Creating, yes. Yeah. I like having yeah. made something. Basically. Yeah, great. Yeah. So I can do that. <laughs> so the game, uh, well, real uh, regular human basketball, the game uh, is coming out on Wednesday. Um, yeah, yeah. So August, post-launch, yeah. what's on the We're cards? For- now for yeah. extra bonus features. <laughs> That's right. We'll get you yeah, to rattle really off good. all the places Easy we games. can find them very shortly. <laughs> but before then, what's on the cards for yourself and Power Hoof post-launch? Uh, um, probably, I don't know. I'm not really sure. much-needed time off, of maybe. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely take a bit of time off. Barney's taking a month off and going to PAX east or whichever the one is that's on in a few months is um and then uh uh we've both got a bunch of prototype ideas we want to be experimenting with um i've i've got some adventure game stuff i want to try out um barney's been messing around with a lot of uh the latest thing was some some tile based kind of rpg stuff which seems really kind of cool um we've got um got another game jam we just did that we're going to sort of try and potentially polish up for something later in the year that might be cool yeah basically continuing doing lots of little weird things <laughs> sounds great so yes back to back to before if people do want to check out um uh, power hoofs work crawl or pre-order regular human basketball where are the bless- best places for them to do those things um you go to powerhoof.com that's probably the best or follow um, powerhoof on twitter I think that's the easiest way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> People know how to do social media. If you've got this far and you're listening to this podcast. And and the game's on Steam, I assume. It will be. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or pre-ordering on <laughs> itch.io. <laughs> you, you can't pre-order it. You no. can wish this. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you can. You might be able to pre-order it on, on itch.io. But I think I put the Steam keys up and the page is already live. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. It's like unofficial pre-order. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. Nice. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining us, Dave. Thank you very much. And uh, no thank you, everyone, for joining us. On another episode of Pixel Civ. Um, thank you for spending some time with evening telling us about regular human basketball, Dave. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah. So it is. Oh, that's. I think we just run out that's of time. All, that's all she said. That's all she wrote. Sorry. <laughs> mm, it's probably all she said either as well. Did she say it? She wrote it. Either way, this episode was hosted by me, Mitchell Lowe, and Scott Quigg. Yes. And it was produced by Fiona Bartholomeus. And our executive producer in the chat, as you might be able to see him, a perverse in the chat, is Johnny D. G. Giovanni. Um, thank you very much to Murdoch University <laughs> School of Arts for supporting Pixel Civ through all 100, 101 episodes. If you'd like to learn more about the great, cre- uh, great creative degree, go to murdoch.edu.au forward slash arts. And as always, I'll be sticking the topics that we talked about and in the show notes and on the website, pixelsiv.com.au. Uh, yep, that's where they are. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. That's fine. And the absolute best thing you can do is head to pixelsiv.com.au forward slash discord if you want to keep up with everything we're doing. And we post everything there first. And you can even chat to us. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know, you can also go to our site to stream episodes, subscribe as a podcast, either on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, or whatever podcast player you like. We're on them all. Uh, we're live every Thursday. Next week at this time, join us, join us for Pixel Sift Plays. Uh, yeah, as we, we haven't, haven't play decided what we'll play yet. Yeah, but- no, we're going to play some indie games, as yeah. we always do. 9th of August. Is that it? No. Our next episode's the 9th of August. Yep. Oh, your next episode's 9th of August, That's but next it. week it'll be a Pixel Sift Plays. All right. Peace Thank out. you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dave, for joining us. Sip, sip. <laughs> <laughs>